Good morning. Yeah. So I, my incoming grad student, Alex, I asked him to join us as well. Good. I am recording this in case anybody is going to say something um, sensitive, like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> like maybe the election is over or something crazy like that. I thought you were going to say you're recording it in case we say something useful that we're going to use. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm recording it. Yes, that's true. Paula. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Good to meet you. Alex, can you uh, oh, mute Dr. Peterson. Say, say hi <laughs> to everyone? Call me town, Alex. Okay, gotcha. Hello, town. Um, and hello, everyone else. Um, I'm one of Dr. Gusto's new graduate students, and I've been working with her for about the past year and a half um, on a variety of projects. Uh, currently, we're uh, working on uh, COVID-19 projects, as well as uh, projects with Lyme disease, and um, hopefully we'll be able to use some of the information that you're collecting with uh, ticks at some point. Oh boy. Hey, Adiola. Adiola. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, I think we should go ahead and get started. And basically just going around the table and catching up on what, what is getting done and what isn't getting done. Uh, hopefully all in the first category and nothing in the second category. Um, maybe what we should do is, do we want to do a quick round of, of introductions just so Alex knows who everybody is? Ali, why don't you give a two second introduction? Sure. Uh, I know already Alex, we met in, uh, this is ecology meetings. Uh, so Alex, I, I've worked on uh, species identification using deep learning models to identify like tick species based on the images. So we started first with taking high quality images from uh, the, the ticks in the lab. And then the next, the next uh, step would be using cell phone images to see how model can perform. Okay, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. Um, we're just keeping busy and trying to keep everybody on task. And I'm going to take a moment just to remind everyone, I'm sure you're so excited, but keep on the up on the T2DOP reporting. So when we get ready for the report in the early spring, we're ready to go. Um, we're working on December meetings, and I was, wasn't sure if this meeting was going to happen. I'm waiting to hear back from all the PIs before setting the meetings. It's just you all are a busy group and trying to find a time that works for everyone is close to impossible, but we will make it happen. <laughs> I, I bet nobody has meetings on Christmas morning. <laughs> oh, town, come yeah, I'm, I'm unavailable, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> Xian Ming, you wanna, you wanna introduce yourself briefly? Oh, yes. Uh, all right, my name is Xian Ming, and I'm from the University of Oklahoma, and the the research we are uh, for this project is on the land use of land cover changes studies. And we're using um, satellite data to map in and track the vegetation change over time and space and see how that uh, has in, any impact on the uh, tick and, and animal host. Jeffrey? Yeah, I'm Jeff Becerra from the University of Oklahoma. I have a joint appointment in the School of Meteorology and in the School of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science. Um, and my sort of background and expertise is um, on weather and climate extremes, uh, especially in the Great Plains. Too hot, too cold, too much rain, too little, too much snow, whatever, ice storms. Those are the types of things I work on. But in the broad context of this project, um, when it gets to interpreting results as a function of weather and climate variables. Uh, that's where my role uh, comes in and, and I'll do my best to help as, as needed. Uh, let's see, Alex, you know Fola, uh, you know Abdu? Yes, yes. Okay, 
These are all the meetings that I've been missing on Friday mornings. Yeah. But the ENM 2020 <laughs> course is over now, so I'll start tuning in. <laughs> Finally, a 43-week long course. Uh, you know Adiola, I assume. Yes. Okay, Henry, can you give a quick intro to yourself for Alex? Sure. Uh, my name is Henry Neiman uh, from the University of Oklahoma. I'm the director of the Supercomputing Center here. Awesome. Good to know. Okay. So it, then, it's good to know because um, what Alex is working on is a special um, is a it, it's a model that is specially um, explicit, and uh, we've been doing the work in collaboration with <coughs> the math department, who told us who made us realize that we're going to be needing a supercomputing to be able to do our work. So just in case we have a, a backup <laughs> place to go. Yeah, so good to know. OK, now, and then there's other components to this group, which are like three or four people who are serious tick specialists um, in both Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, and so uh, really our only representative of the, the field component is Abdu, and we don't have anybody to speak to the pathogen testing yet. Um, Abdu, you want to give a, a summary of what you have been doing with the, the field collections, at least on the Kansas side? And Daniel's here okay. now, so he's been on those teams as well. Mm -hmm. So last week, uh, we went to, um, we spent all week for like five uh, sites, three of them in West, uh, Western Kansas, and, uh, or four of them, and one of uh, in the next to Kansas City. Um, sorry? Keep going, you're fine. Yeah, so we got some uh, larvae and few exudus scapularis around. Um, we didn't like, get a lot of larvae. We were excited about the Kansas uh, view park. Um, like before three months, we got hundreds of nymph, nymph, but this time we got just a few nymphs and uh, I think one or two. I exudes cabularis adults. So one very interesting thing about this is when we started the field collections, it was all Lone Star ticks. And those carry different sets of pathogens and do different things. And the densities were just off the charts at times, what, two or 300 ticks on a single trap. Um, these Ixodes scapularis, this is the, the vector of Lyme disease. So it's, it's a really interesting tick. Um, but if you read the CDC publications about its range, its range, its Western limit is in like Illinois, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And basically just CDC has it wrong. And before this project started, I had a bit of a um, a sparring match with, with the CDC researchers about that exact point. And, you know, essentially what it comes down to is they consider Ixodes scapularis to be not established in the Great Plains. And we're basically laying a basis for arguing, sorry, they're here permanently mm -hmm. established. But they have this weird biology, and you know, Susan Little, the tick specialist, uh, predicted it perfectly. She said, when you do your October, November sampling, you're going to start seeing Exodes scapularis. And so we go from being absolutely dominated by lone star ticks to now zero lone star ticks and just these one or two Exodes scapularis. So it's a really neat, neat phenology, and it'll probably take us to a, a first publication where we will be able to show we have larvae, nymphs, and adults of, uh, of the species. They're definitely breeding here. They're definitely established. 
let's not close our eyes to to <clears throat> something that's real. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, the we're actually one of the Lyme disease projects that we're working on involves uh, constructing a model for the uh, Exodus scapularis and white-footed mice in Kansas. So hopefully if you guys are able to collect enough data, we can uh, use it to parameterize that model. Um, Alex, I did volunteer you behind you <laughs> for the tick collection. So, <laughs> yeah. so you're going to be one of the people collecting the ticks too. <laughs> awesome. So uh, anyhow, the, the plan in each state is five sites that get Sorry, yeah, five sites that get five. sampled um, once every quarter. And so Abdu was just describing the kind of fall sampling and then there'll be a spring sampling basically as soon as it starts warming up, you know, in probably in early March. And then there's one site in Kansas and one site in Oklahoma. And actually we've managed to raise this to two sites in Kansas thanks to Anu, um, that are getting sampled every two weeks. And so the, the Kansas site that we're in charge of is um, out kind of north and a little west of Clinton Lake. It's a, a wildlife area um, near the, the thriving city of Stull, Kansas. Um, best known because the little church that used to be in its cemetery was known as one of the, I don't think, like 12 gates to hell. Mm. And they, <laughs> they did the right thing and they knocked the church down. <laughs> um, so Stull, Kansas, I think has one, one, one business and one church now, but it's not exactly you know, a place to go for a college education. But we can certainly go there and collect ticks. Uh, Okay, so field team, any thoughts, worries, concerns, anything other than just, you know, keeping the forward movement? I have a question. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, one of our notice, like uh, in the fall, the ground uh, was covered by leaves. So how much that will affect the collect or the collection methods or is that like making um, something that uh, reduces the activity of ticks? You mean because because you have leaf fall? Leaf, yes, I, a lot. Well, I mean, it's fall, so that, that happens, but uh, I wouldn't think that that would be a negative, I would think it would be a positive uh, because it's it's essentially cover for the ticks to get down into and be insulated from the cold as it starts, you know, getting cold like last night was. But, you know, remember nobody on this call is a is a real tick specialist. So, <laughs> so let's, um, let's ask Susan next time she's on a call or uh, but I, I wouldn't think that would be a negative for the text. Yeah, a negative for us, I think. Like for oh, collecting, maybe. using, yeah, dragging, flagging. Yeah, but if, if the ticks are out looking for mammal hosts, then, you know, I think they'll be up on the vegetation. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for field group. Have you, I look at my uh, website, I have not seen the photo, field photo from the field group from Kansas. I know have we're you taking chance them. to submit some photos? Uh, we have all the pictures of all the times that we have been there, uh, but I don't, we, I, I think that we haven't uploaded them to the system. So we have the, we have all the pictures. And uh, we should submit them. Then. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> quite easy, Daniel. Yeah. 
because it really help uh, both you see where your site also going to help us to see what's the landscape looks like okay uh something that uh, usually i am thinking regarding the picture thing is that for example in this last uh last effort uh, last collection effort a lot of the dry ice traps came uh, as complete negatives so no ticks on all the 16 dry ice traps uh in that case you also need all the all the you need all the picture all the pictures there okay negative data is just as important as positive data okay 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 so, yeah, yeah, we just... just need to know where your sampling located Right. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter you get a tick or no tick. Yeah, based on that information, we can study the land cover that uh, change or the vegetation dynamic, the seasonality. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we yeah. we will we will make sure to submit the information to the correct platform. Great. You know where the platform is, Daniel, or do you want I think... Ming to circulate it? Uh, it will be better if he can circulate it. Yeah. Okay. Jiang Ming, can you just put that on the Google group email list? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, can, they... I can actually I can send that to the chat right now. Cool, cool. Okay. And then the other thing we need to do to kind of uh, give some closure to the to the the field work or some some uh, you know getting other pieces of it into the um into the hopper um uh, is getting the ticks sent down to um to susan's lab so abdu maybe you could take care of that um you know basically it's a matter of it's it's complicated because they're in alcohol and so we need to talk with Lori about um uh, getting you certified for shipping alcohol um, and I, I assume it needs to be shipped on dry ice. So probably what you should do is, is contact Susan and contact Lori and copy me on both communications. Uh, but basically the sooner we get this first, you know, five months of ticks down to Susan, uh, she will start the pathogen testing and we'll start getting the, the really exciting results out of this. Okay, I'll send that email around as soon as after this meeting. Okay, it's probably two separate emails. One to Susan, you know, what's your shipping protocol? And the other to Lori saying, I know I'm going to be shipping some tubes with ethanol. What do you want me to do? Okay. Okay. And probably you'll need to um, take out the big tubes from the first couple of months and mm -hmm re-situate those ticks in the small tubes. Okay. Because the whole thing about shipping ethanol is the quantity of ethanol. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anything else about field collections or field data? Okay, automated identification, Ali, I hope you're not letting your postdoc get in the way of writing that paper. Well, I haven't started writing that, but <laughs> which means unfortunately I did. <laughs> uh, but also I haven't been in touch with Susan recently. So I should, I should send her an email and say like how we want to uh, format the paper and like where we need to start. Yeah, and, and also ask her, let's let her drive the bus as far as where to send it, because, you know, your papers, and you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of everything you've done in your dissertation and related stuff, but it's kind of hard to find where to send them. You know, maybe it's going to be just journal event medical entomology again, which is fine. Okay. You know, but let, let's let Susan make that decision. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, I will send her a kind of like a, a, what is that? What do you call that? The out, outline to, mm -hmm. to see where we need to start. Good. Yeah. And then later on, we should start talking about cell phone photos. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Oh, it's downstairs. <laughs> Sorry. My my office mates threw me out of my office and then still come to ask uh, favors and and um, advice. So uh, yeah, so you know, as far as more analyses, at some point we need to do kind of the technology transfer where where you start guiding Marlon so that he can run analyses. Um, you know, we might as well get at least the basics of um, TensorFlow into hands beyond just yours. Sure. I also did for for the postdoc. I was running some a kind of like tests on models, and I just did the newer version, the updated version of TensorFlow. So it's not still operational for a big set of like data and thing, but I tried on different images and it seems kind of like a little bit stronger than the one that we had. Interesting. So I was kind of, yeah, I'm gonna work on that to see if I can make that one operational and send it to Marla. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, modeling, math mathematical modeling, Fola? I don't have any updates other than what we've done. Um, what what, we, what um, um, Emily presented the other day. So she's um, she'll be giving a talk tomorrow at this North Carolina um, conference. And so is Alex. So Alex is also presenting a little bit of what he has done, um, an approximation of of. Um, think well of the model that we have um, so it's not the full model um, yeah so that's what I have right now I don't have anything um, as far as what idealized working working you, on you've been spending all your time playing around with COVID-19 I know it well not not <laughs> well, I think I think yeah well that is true that it is, is kind of an emergency it's okay yeah that is true that is true <laughs> And, and with Emily, we're also, we're, we're planning on strong arming you guys to, um, you know, help sweep through Konza for ticks on, on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the, uh, the burnt patches to see if we'll get ticks. We'll, we'll dig into their data and then strong arm you guys to help us check, so. So that's, that, those, that's our thought for now. I, I think we could definitely organize something like that. The only things that I'd say is, first of all, uh, be sure you check the literature to make sure we're not reinventing wheels. No, we're not. And then also, um, Kanza has a somewhat cumbersome system of having to <coughs> request permission and they need a proposal and all of that. They're, they're a little bit kind of over the top on that i feel right, right. so yeah, yeah but, so um well next month when i'm done with you know teaching and all that um i'll be spending some time with emily to look through conzad's data and then neon i think neon does some fire and tick stuff and so to see if we can um what day what what kind of data they have that we can use. So that, that would help address your question of making sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. So uh, the neon thing is interesting. Um, I am, this is kind of a, one of those old projects that, that never seems to end. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm on a project with a former student of mine from back in the 90s. And a really interesting uh, military lab that tests ticks um, submitted by by um, members of the armed forces, mm -hmm. and it's you know thousands and thousands of ticks from all over the U.S. And it's a project where I did all the analyses what five years ago, mm -hmm. and wrote the paper and sent it around, and then like four and three quarters years ago. They came back and said, well, it looks like an interesting paper. 
and really novel and really interesting, uh, but it's old, so maybe you ought to redo it. <laughs> like, that's why I sent it to you four years ago. Um, so I, I think Abdu may be involved in, in reworking up those data. Um, but in kind of getting ready for that, I was prowling around the NEON site mm -hmm. and they actually have, I think it's 25-ish sites across the US and they have tick data. And then for, it might be 20 to 30% of the ticks, they have pathogen data as well. Mm -hmm. And it's quite well organized. So I downloaded their most recent versions of all of that. Uh, a couple days ago, and mm -hmm. Abdul and I are going to be playing with that. So if you want, don't worry about processing through the data. Um, we'll, we'll be doing that regardless. Okay. And then knowing that you're interested in, I assume, just Kanza data. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll keep a special eye on that. I know it's precisely georeferenced, and it's all based on flagging and dragging and such. So it, okay. it may be interesting. I just don't know how dense the data are. Right. Um, well, yeah, so Kanza data, well, since, since um, Neon's data uh, spasse through the entire country, so maybe just be on the lookout for um, anything that has to do with buy and ticks. OK, we'll, we'll certainly watch. Um, I think the 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 the, there won't be anything about fire because it's it's just primary occurrence data. Uh -oh. But the Kanza data can probably be keyed to their maps of fire schedules. Right. And so I think the information is there with a, a few minor GIS operations. Okay. So, we'll, awesome. but we'll, we'll share with everybody what the data look like. And again, they may just be so sparse that there's there's not enough to go on there, but okay. we'll see. Okay. So, so this just brings to mind what you said earlier on about about um, ticks in in Kansas and why the CDC are like you know we don't have it, um, but. If if Kanza and well ne if Neon had been like collecting data for ticks generally in the country, shouldn't shouldn't they have seen that we have um, those kind of, well exodus capillaries here in in Kansas? They they have kind of their own set of criteria, and so they have records from Kansas, but they don't consider the tick to be established here, and. As far as I can see, it's obviously established, but the problem or the difference is it's at much lower densities. Okay. So, so you know, the, the density defines the establishment then. I think that I think that they don't have a clear definition for that because, you know, in this exchange that I had with them, they said some pretty stupid things like you know the leading edge of the range of the species is in mm -hmm. Illinois. No, the leading edge or the, you know, the, the range extreme of the species is probably just right around Manhattan, Kansas. Right. And Susan seems to have the same sort of thing going on in Oklahoma where, you know, they kind of get out to east central Oklahoma, but not farther. Mm. Okay. So, I, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard for people to see reality when they have their heads up their butts. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, I'm, I'm envisioning that maybe a year into the sampling. So next summer, I'm envisioning that as a, uh, as writing a paper on, you know, let's correct the CDC maps so that we have a correct view of where at least the vector is. And mm -hmm. by then, hopefully, we'll have some pathogen detections as well. Right. But you know, the the thing about Exodes scapularis and Lyme disease in Kansas was so extreme. You may remember this, Fola, mm -hmm. but when we were writing the the proposal two years ago, mm -hmm. near the end, Susan said, "Okay, guys, now." 
remove all assertions that Lyme disease and Exodes scapularis are in Kansas. Right. right. And so we we had to, you know, take these statements of, you know, we'll be studying the dynamics of of Borrelia burgdorferi, the the agent that causes Lyme disease. You know, we'll be studying it in Kansas. We had to remove all of that because Susan said that the tick reviewers and you know the CDC types would rake us over the coals and we'd never get the proposal funded. Mm. So I want to put that debate to bed. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a very different phenomenon to call it not established versus to call it low density. Right. So anyhow, that that we'll do that in six months. Okay. That way we'll have a full year of monitoring and just you know, we can at least make the basic point. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, we'll so look out for the for, for what you guys get from the NEONS data. Yeah, we we will send that around definitely, and um, and yeah, you know, if we need to or if we want to develop a, you know, a one week field blitz on on Kanza or something like that, we can do it. Okay. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, and remember with those presentations from Emily and Alex, remember to put those on the famous T2DOP site. Oh, yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, one of the <laughs> most useless inventions of any <laughs> consultant who is bleeding money off of NSF. Yeah. yeah. Jeannie yeah. and I are still upset, or at least I am, Jeannie, that you put all these data into T2DOP it ought to just write big chunks of your annual report for you. And it doesn't. You have to pull them out of T2DOP and write your own NSF annual report. Hmm. Well, yeah. Jeannie, well, are you still upset? I'm not upset, but it does not work as smooth as one would like. I would oh, like to see them tweak for the amount of money that every NSF grant pays them per year to have the system. I would think it would work more seamlessly. You are such a diplomat. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, you know, every one of the grants in this program, this EPSCOR program, it says in the description of the grant opportunity, include $12,500 per year for NSF data services. And it's this consultancy to this couple who run this piece of garbage program that harvests your data and then does nothing with it. So anyhow, I register my protest. <laughs> okay, geospatial, Xiang Ming. Yeah, from our side, let me see. Not much to report. I said there's one thing I'm going to might be interested in. Uh, we began to look into the forest cover in Oklahoma and Kansas. So we are using the microwave data and optical data. So preliminary results for 2016, we used the data, the microwave data from 2016 and 17. And so we've got a first version of uh, forest, non-forest map in Kansas and Oklahoma. So we're at a stage of trying to evaluate uh, um, the microwave data because they acquire on a different time, some image on the winter, some image mm -hmm. in the summer. We prefer all the summer image. Winter image, you have lots of uh, snow or, or ice in the soil or has a background affected. So, yeah, so we made some progress on, on um, this site and probably in a couple of weeks, we should have some, a stable version of 30 meter forest mapping in wow. Oklahoma and Kansas. And it is, it, it compared with uh, the, in the uh, rich early version of data available to the communities are all based on the optical data. And these are microwave data uh, 
are related to the structure of tree, all this stuff. So we strongly believe by combining the optical microwave data, we can have much better, more stable forest map. So they have got to lay out some basis for um, the spatial modeling you guys are going to later on use the yeah. next one. The other one is Xiang Ming, before you go away from, from the forest cover, um, I assume that as you develop those products, you will compare with the results from the optical sensors. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it'd be really, really interesting based on that comparison to also compare through time with the optical sensors. And the reason why is I'm doing some work um, like with rare snakes and lizards in Kansas that is showing that uh, these species that are restricted to forest are not just restricted to forest, they're restricted to forest that has been forest for a long time. Yeah. And so uh, starting to distinguish between what is afforestation, you know, kind of newly forested area versus long-term forested area, that'd be a really interesting um, product to de develop because it may tell us a lot about the ticks as well. Yeah, that's great. So what do you mean by <clears throat> how many years, how many decades do you need to be <laughs> the I, age or the stand age? I, I would love maybe the last 5,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, no, we, we can you know, the, the Landsat data at 30 meters go back to the 1980s. Yeah. Now, obviously the quality goes down as you go back. Yeah. Uh, but just that, you know, 40 years would be really, really interesting. Um, you know, it, but again, it's the sort of thing where it would be really neat to have the super precise current and into the future but also, you know, less precisely look back into the past. Yeah. I think uh, your wish will be granted. <laughs> <laughs> I love <Yeah>. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is um, the, the work of planning is we're going to, the question we've been asked at a starting point is, uh, we're going to map the current forest with a microwave and the optic level together. Yeah. Then we're going to use those as a reference. We're going to ask the question, how many years those forest was as forest? Okay. So we're going to produce a stand age, kind yes. of stand age. Yes, okay. wonderful. Back, back to 1980s. So the methodology wise is already done and we published a paper a couple of years ago for Oklahoma. So we, we're using the data for 2010. Then we backtrack to 1984. So we have those um, forest state stand age stuff, right? That'll be so really actually exciting. this lead to my I want to change the second one based on that Oklahoma work. We, our question ask is as the forest area increase over time, or would it would it encroachment in this case increase over years and what's the temperature change or albedo change? So we had a paper now it's under second revision now. We're doing the second revision. So will be published uh, in the agriculture and forestry meteorology. Yeah. So uh, hopefully I, I can fill my still already complete the revision. I maybe spend a week or some time to uh, look into that. We can resubmit that again. Hopefully the agriculture and forest Geology will be uh, approved now. So 
then that way um, we get we get into look into this uh, with encroachment uh, on the climate impact. So in that sense, is after we finish in this 2016 and 17 data, we'll do a similar sense extended for a longer time. Then also extended spatial domain. This time we're going to cover both Oklahoma and Kansas as part of this EBSCO project. Cool. Yeah. I, so I, I think wait. that's the uh, uh, our uh, update to this point. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, that. All right. That gives us updates on the major chunks of this grant, except for pathogen testing. But I think the pathogen testing will start as soon as we start shipping samples to Susan. Uh, yeah. She has some samples from her own sampling. Uh, anything else on anybody's mind or anything that we should be doing and aren't? Just one quick question on uh, to sort of the weather climate side. Mm -hmm. just, um, you know, we're doing, well, the nice thing about our data collection is every day we just collect more data, right? So that's the good thing. Um, but one of the things that we are working on for a variety of reasons um, are rapid transitions from one regime to another. Um, as we, some of our research has really demonstrated that that's sort of accelerating, the hydrologic cycle is accelerating in our region. We go back and forth a little bit faster than we did in previous, you know, what used to be decadal is now annual and so on. Um, in some ways, depending on how you want to look at it. But we are looking at these features called whiplash events, where we go from one extreme to the other. Um, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas doesn't really stay at normal very often. It, it kind of goes back and forth, but it's uh, accelerating in some ways. So um, as you all are doing some of your work, um, think about that in terms of what that might mean for, I don't know if it means anything, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, for for this environmental, but obviously I, it, it involves a lot of, it, it does mean something to a lot of species, um, but I'm not sure if it means anything for these species, but that's something to think about. That's one thing that we are working on just broadly, uh, trying to tackle all these rapid transitions from either drought to too much rainfall um, or uh, hot to cold and back, you know, just constantly going back what we call these whiplash events or tr rapid transitions. So um, we have a, a whole set of database um, um, and activities going on about that. So as that becomes, as this data is collected, keep that in mind that we will have that available uh, as part of the project. That's really neat. Um, maybe we should probably we'll have to come back to this in you know, six months or a year or something like that. But we do have basically three, maybe four sites that are being sampled bi-weekly. And I assume quarterly is just not gonna be enough grain to, to detect things. But those three or four sites that are sampled bi-weekly, uh, we should consider a, a time series analysis to, to ask, you know, whether this sort of change at those sites um, has some detectable effect on the tick populations. Right. Well, I know my day's coming at some point here. Um, so just, uh, just throwing out more food for thought um, in terms of interpretation in the future. So just keep in mind, we'll, we will be ready when you all are. So. Cool. Okay, anything else? Okay, well, it's good to see all of you. And remember T2DOP and, you know, when you have things to show, you know, Xiangming with your, with your map of forest cover, um, you know, put them on the Google group list or put a link to them on the Google, Google group list. Or if, you know, if there are, images from the presentations from the students, just, you know, you use that email list so that we're all kind of aware of what's going on in between these meetings. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everybody have a good day.
Yep. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.